that was known about the game of football, offensively and defensively, and I improved my skill set to the point where coaches were interested in having me to try out with their teams. Mm. Uh, high school, in, in, in the United States Army, in college, and in professional football. I never played on a second team. I was always a starter at every level. And all that helped me to understand was that I needed to do more work and to keep my skill set at the upper echelon. And as I tried to tell you guys yesterday, to my knowledge, and with all of the artificial intelligence that's available today, I am the only professional football player to ever play in the National Football League and play seven positions and be top rated in the top ten of each one. Mm. A punter, a running back, a quarterback, a wide receiver, a punt returner, a kickoff returner, and a defensive cornerback, at which I made All-American first team at Indiana University in 1948. Well, George, speaking speaking of that, what was it like at at Indiana University back back then? I was a second-class citizen. Okay. As a student at Indiana University on a football scholarship, meaning that I was asked, and invited to come here as a student and to play football. I could not live in the dormitory. I could Mm. not eat in the cafeteria except at one table. I could not go to the motion picture theaters in the city of Bloomington except on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and there was a balcony where I had to sit. I couldn't swim in the swimming pool. And I couldn't eat in the restaurant in the city of Bloomington, Indiana. Well, wow. that's what it was like. And I called my father after I had been in this city for two weeks and told him that I did not want to attend Indiana University. After I had told him all of those reasons why, he said, is there another reason why you are in Bloomington, Indiana, on a football scholarship? And he hung the phone up, and it came to me as I lie in my bunk that night with tears coming out of my eyes that my dad and mom had told me two things. They loved me and that I needed to be educated. And discrimination and racism had no impact on me from that point on. Hmm. I did the level of work to earn a degree from Indiana University in four years. And I went into professional football and provided a decent standard of living for my brother, for my mother and my younger brother and sister, because two other brothers were already out of high school and married with families. Wow, wow. But I was able to do the whole thing. And, of course, the greatest motivation of all was to tell my dad when I was 12 years of age, I wanted to grow up to be just like him. And two years later, I was bigger than my father. (laughs) At the age of 14, I was 165 pounds, and he was still at the 150. But he was the man in which I lived. Wow. 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 Your father father sounds like a giant. He was a giant in a form or fashion. As quiet as a church mouse, but boy, when he spoke, (laughs) volume. (laughs) And you know the other thing, and I, and I, I didn't tell you guys this yesterday, my father, in my judgment, never told me to do anything. He always put it in the form of a question. Will you? To me, it was a command. Mm. And so I naturally, being a dependent, I said, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. But I'll well. tell you, it meant everything to me in the maturation process of becoming, hopefully, a real man. Right, right. So playing college football as an African-American when you did, how many other African-American players were there at Indiana University at that time? We had four. Okay. And that's wow. really what made it a lot easier on me because the other three guys were upperclassmen okay. and they protected me. They were my advisors. They were 
<laughs> my friend. Mm. And all I had to do was to listen and to perform. I didn't have any extraneous problems with which to deal. I couldn't dance <laughs> and I and I had and I had my hands full in just practicing football, going to class and study. And I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, so that's where my energies went. Okay. And it okay. served me very, very, very well. Wow. Now, George, I had shared with you uh, you know, my personal uh, experience with recovery from alcoholism and and how uh, you know I was in the sixth year of of sobriety and and you had mentioned to me about your long term sobriety. It's been over eighty eighty six years, right? Since... Eighty six years, never never tasted alcohol, and, and never you know... tasted alcohol, Steve, because the four thou shalt not that the coach wrote on a piece of paper to mm. my mother when she said I will only sign the certificate allowing you to play football if the coach sends me those activities that you cannot be involved in no smoking <laughs> no drinking no eating of a lot of sweets and no staying out late and I she assured me <laughs> that she understood one of those that I would not be staying out late because she had the key to our home. <laughs> <laughs> and you I see, guys, it. back when when I was a teenager, you couldn't live in the neighbor's house or in <laughs> a cousin's house, mm -hmm. or you couldn't go to the young lady that you were interested in and be a, a welcome guest in their homes without. Wherever you were trying to stay, that person having contact with your mom and dad to find out if it was all right with them if mm -hmm. you spent the evening. See, now, now, see, we're talking about their value system, George. And I, <laughs> Tell I, me I, about I, it. And I believe, as I've told you several, several times, that's where folks, folk, folks like yourself and, and obviously what, what you know, we're doing here with, with Wealth First and Life can can help some of these younger guys that are coming along now that's you know trying to make the make that jump from college into the pros or from pros into the to what I call the real world um George what would you say or or excuse me how would you who would you say was i guess responsible for you making the transition from the n f l back into the real world? Let me, let me tell you the one person that everybody, I think, can relate to, even the uh, very young. Okay. There was a man named Jackie Robinson. Yes, sir. Who played football, basketball, baseball, and ran track and field at UCLA back in the 30s. Okay. And Jackie Robinson was not the best African-American baseball player in the United States of America, and yet he broke the color line because I honestly believe that Jackie is the only African-American baseball player who could have withstood the trials and tribulations that he went through by himself. And I have said this to you before. If if Mrs. Rachel Robinson is mm. listening to this phone interview, I want her to know I honestly believe that she was the link between Jackie Robinson and eternity as mm. a human being. Because Jackie had a quick temper and didn't mind fighting and could fight. And yet, <laughs> you never heard Jackie Robinson get bothered to the point of a demonstration by anything said to, about, or done to him mm. because he realized that his place in human history was going to mean that any human being can, if he or she will, mm -hmm. make it their livelihood to be the best human being they could be without retaliation. And see, wow. you ask me about the number of African Americans at Indiana University when I was here. It was easy for me because I had wow. three older guys right, who helped right, right. me to understand 
George, be careful of this. George, watch out for that. You said or you did. I would advise you not to say or do that again. Jackie didn't have that. It was all on him. And you know, the tragedy is, as we speak, what I would not do, and this is a very critical suggestion, Mm -hmm. I would not have the good high school athletes holding the country in a band while Mm -hmm. they decide the school that they will choose to attend. Mm -hmm. I think that is the worst thing that can happen because these 17 and 18 and 19 year old kids need our help more at that period in their lives than they will at any other point because it'll get them on that straight and narrow. Narrow. Yes, sir. I agree with you there, George. Other experiences that other people have can be made meaningful as they make decisions in their lives. I certainly agree with you, George. I, in fact, I oftentimes tell guys from the, you know, whether it be former players or even some of the some of the active active players, I said, listen, guys, the best retired player is a more informed active player. You know, in other words, if you can meet folks like yourself, if you can take the take the take the time out to to truly see what. See what's going on outside of the game while you're actually playing the game. It makes it so much easier to move into that second or that third, third, third phase, phase, man, of your life. And you are going to be living a lot longer than you will ever have the opportunity to be an active participant in athletics. Wow, you're right. You're so right. And and, and another thing that that we talk about also uh, is at First in Life is surrounding yourself with good people and finding that team that's going to support you and carry you through the tough times and help educate you on how to deal with adversity and and be the best person you can be. I mean, that that is so clear in your story, George, and that's what makes it so inspirational. So, uh, Well, let know, me tell you yeah. another thing that is about to happen that carries on. This May 17th, the largest educational institution in the state of Indiana is Ivy Tech Community College. There are 14 campuses. My wife and I are receiving honorary degrees for community service on May 17th from Ivy Tech Community College. And this is just an admonition that we have lived Mm. as a community couple and assisted our communities in any and everything that we possibly could. And I'll tell you, this is, in a French word, say magnifique, as far as my wife and I are concerned. Mm. This is worth everything that we have attempted to do with and for others in our lives. Wow. Well, George, since you own that own that topic, as as we you know, as we were talking about earlier, first in life is about life and love and and and, and you know finding your best life now. Now, I guess. Uh, so, just out of curiosity, tell us a, a, a brief story about how you met Miss Viola. Oh, now <laughs> you're asking me to do something that's impossible. I cannot be brief. <laughs> Well, you don't have to be brief. Tell it. Well, I'm, let me tell you so that you won't take up any of my time. <laughs> I went into the United States Army February 4th of 1946. Okay. In April of 1946, I emerged from basic training. I was stationed in Camp Robert E. Lee in Petersburg, Virginia. Okay. Five miles from the camp where I was in service was Virginia State College for Negroes. And, of course, I knew about Virginia State College for Negroes because they were part of the CIAA Athletic Conference. Mm Mm-hmm. And I decided when I got out of service, I mean, got out of training camp, and I had the freedom of spending the days where I wanted to, I went up to Virginia State College to watch their football team practice. And while sitting in the stadium all by myself, watching Virginia State College 
practice football, I was suddenly aware that sitting two doors, or rather two rows beneath me in the empty stadium was another human being. (laughs) 